Yeah, I was working out what I was going to call our message this morning and uh, I still hadn't seen anything and then I saw Kita post that and I was like, you know, can they stand? And I was thinking on the, uh, whatever day that was, during the week I had life group with some of the young mums and I happened to have Parker, Kita, she doesn't know this, but Kita had gone off to the toilet and she gave him to me and, and so I kind of sort of stood him up and by the chair and then I was like, oh, I wonder if he can stand, like... And so I quickly tried to sit him back down again. And, you know, when you're a parent and you watch that sort of thing, you you so want your kid to be able to stand. And, you know, even for Parker, I don't know that that was actually walking. That looked like stumbling with style. But, you know, as a parent, you're like, wow, that was walking, you know. And so I want to encourage us to have that approach with people. Are they able to stand? And some of these stories I'll tell you and you can take a note. So in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 1 is actually a story about an, an Amalek. And an Amalek, he comes to King David. And what he's telling King David is that Saul is dead. And the Bible says that, you know, he's holding this sort of crown and he's holding this bracelet. And he's expecting that it's going to be really good news to King Saul. And so we pick it up in verse 9 as the Amalek is talking to King David. And it says this, and he said, um, he said to me again, please stand over me and kill me, for anguish has come upon me, and my life still, re- and my life, but my life still remains in me. So I stood over him and I killed him because I was sure that he could not live after he had fallen. Now, we're, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. When, when you look at that, it's a bit hard to know for sure. It is more likely that the Amalek was actually like a, what they call a body scavenger because if you read the chapter before, it actually talks about when Saul is there with his armour bearer and yes, he does feel he's been wounded in battle and he's saying to his armour bearer, like, you know, put a sword through me and the ar- armour bearer is like, no, I couldn't. You know, I couldn't touch you. And so, you know, it's quite graphic. It says that Saul gets his sword and just dives on it and kills himself. And so the armor bearer sees what he's done and he does exactly the same thing. And then in another chapter in Chronicles, it talks about the Philistines who have killed them. It says that they go out the next day and they they find Saul's body and it says that they take his armor and his head, which makes me think really most likely this Amalek has just come across you know, Saul and and found him dead and actually just taken the the crown and the bracelet. But that's really not what my focus point is. My focus point is this. He says, because I was sure that he could not live after he had fallen. And so I want you to think about this morning, maybe someone in your life or in your sphere around your life that maybe you have that same mentality. You've already decided that they've fallen and you've already decided in your mind, so I'm sure they can't live. And we're all probably thinking, I don't, I don't think that. Or, you know, can they get saved? And there are people that come across our life, especially I think those that are close to us, and we have already decided that. I don't think that they can stand. When we look at our young bubbies coming through the church, we want to see them stand. And yet, and, and you know, even if they just do one step or really don't do any steps, just stagger because the trolley's moving, we're so excited. But really, God wants us to have the same attitude with people around our lives. That the smallest thing, we're like, yeah, they can stand. I, I, I saw that. They, I'm sure I heard them mention God about something. And really have that same tenacity to go, I believe that they can stand. Romans 14 verse 4 says this. Romans 14 4. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. For indeed... He will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. You know, we, we've got, I want you to be encouraged, whoever it is that's around your life, to understand God can make them stand. It doesn't matter who it is, it doesn't matter what you, what you see, we've got to believe that God can do that. Because I think when we develop a mentality that there are people we've already given up on, then it's very hard to to see. And I believe often what happens is we leave them behind. In our mind, and we've got to have wisdom. The Bible says choose our friends carefully. But even in our prayer and our intercession, if we've given up and we've left them behind. Another story in 1 Samuel 30 um, is in verse 11. Again, it's another group of Amaleks. And it says that they've come and they've, they've gone into Ziklag, which is where David 
was living and David it was just wasn't there at the time and the Bible says that the Amalites basically stole everything and they've taken away everything that David has and so when David gets back you know the people there his own friends are ready to stone him they're really angry and great thing how David encourages himself but what happens is David then is heading to try and track down these people and I love it because as he's tracking them down, the Bible says he comes across an Egyptian that the Amaleks have just left because he was sick. And I, I love it that they, you have to read the whole chapter, but it says that David then feeds and, and gives this guy water. He doesn't know that this person's going to be beneficial to him. He doesn't know like, oh, well, if we get him well. He didn't ask him any questions until he had fed and watered him until he'd seen that his strength was back in it. And the scripture then says, and when he then saw he was strong, he starts to ask him who he is. And then he's like, oh, well, we just raided this place. And, but, you know, my master's left me. And it's that Egyptian that tells David where the uh, people have gone. And the Bible says that they then go and they take all of the spoil plus so much more. Have you ever stopped to think about maybe the person that you're walking by that you've already decided they can't stand or that they're not going to help me or benefit my Christian walk or my life or anything to do with me, that they could be the one person if you would just stop and give them a little bit of time, if you would just stop and encourage them and just go, yeah, I believe you can stand. I believe that you can stand and I'm going to feed and I'm going to water you whether I see a benefit in my own life. It's so powerful, the people that we walk by. Are there people that we have given up on that we don't believe are going to come to Christ? And it's so easy to do. Proverbs 24.16 says this. Proverbs 24.16. For a righteous man may fall seven times and arise again. When, it, when it's talking about that, about arising seven times, it doesn't mean, well, yeah, I know they've been back to church seven times and then that's it. It's talking about a, a place of continual thing. God's going, you know what? You don't know. You don't know who it is and whether they're going to come to the Lord. You don't know whether they're going to rise again and what's going to happen. Another story is the story of Absalom. Absalom in uh, the Old Testament, at some point in his life, he, he kills someone. And the Bible says because he's killed someone, he knows that he's done wrong. And the Bible says that he runs away. And he's away for a while, but there's something in his heart that he wants to come back. He wants to come back. I want to tell you now, anyone that's run away from God deep in the, in the inner part of their body, if you have asked Jesus into your heart, you are marred for Christ. It doesn't matter where you go. There's always that, I want to come back. But he knows that he, he can't come back. And the Bible says that, you know, he, he ends up getting a guy called Joab. And Joab knows as well, you know, like there's no way that the king's going to let this happen. And so they kind of trick the king. And he, Joab goes and he gets this uh, woman. He says she's a wise woman. I want to encourage you this morning. Are you a wise woman? Are you there trying to work a way to see someone come back to the Lord? And so the Bible says that Joab lines her up to say everything. And she comes before the king and she gives him this story about how she had two sons that she loved so much. And she said, and one of them, he, you know, murdered um, his brother. And so now they want him to be uh, pushed away as well. They want to kill him as well. It's very interesting sometimes when you hear someone else's story how you can change what you think. Oh, that's terrible. Oh, yes, look, you know, let's just pray and let's stand. And, and sometimes that's the way God brings it around to us, that he, he twists it around for you to realise, what about if that was someone that you knew? What about the person that you have that heckle feeling for, that you're like, just no way is that going to happen? And I love what she says in 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 14. This is her talking about her son who's been banished. And she says this, Yet God does not take away a life, but he devises means so that his banished ones are not expelled from him. How, how cool is that? God, God is always making a way. He doesn't want it that anyone's banished. Now, no, that doesn't mean that everybody will be saved because it still comes down to a choice. But church, we're not the ones that are making that decision as to who and who we shouldn't work on and who will be won over at the over 55s this week they were singing a song in christ alone it's funny how we can sing songs but not walk out songs 
And the verse said this, no power in hell, no power in hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. That is, you know, are, are we believing that for someone else? Someone else that you've seen who's given their heart to the Lord. Often it always amazes me when people like, maybe someone's not here and, you know, they'll be like, oh, whatever happened to, you know, I'm just wondering about, I'm like, give, ring them, go and see. Because for us as, as pastors, one of the things that we'll do, we don't give, if they find another church, then that's fantastic. That's the whole thing. You need to be under a shepherd and have someone nurturing you. And so if they find another church, I mean, we ignore them, but we don't think we need to be like ringing them and checking them. But if they've not, we want to keep that door open. Because the Bible says that when your sheep are wandering around, a shepherd needs to care for his flock. But you know, every one of you here is a shepherd to care about somebody might have been the person you brought or the person that you talked to. And sometimes, rather than always checking with us what happened, it's you to go. You find out. And if they're not in a church, you keep praying for them and you spend time with them and you reach out to them and you water them and you feed them like they did the Egyptian. Because God doesn't want anyone to be in that banished state. Ephesians 4.32 tells us to be kind to one another. Sometimes that's hard, tender-hearted. Forgiving one another. Forgiving one another just as Christ forgave us. Because sometimes it's easy to reach out to people who've not done anything wrong to us. But when they've hurt us and offended us and upset us. But we don't know who God is going to use and who God is going to save. That's, that's what I love about it. I, I, I know that God does certain things just to, to show us. Look in the New Testament for Saul. Like if you look at Saul, if I was asking you now this week and I will do in a little while when we're taking communion, you ever think about who God's putting on your heart to invite to church and, and to try and spend time with, you're not going to pick a Saul, okay? There's this person that you know, he's in Northbridge and he's, you know, persecuting people and murdering people and he's actually going out of his way. He's anti-Christian, he's anti-everything. You should re his his posts and then God goes, okay, that's the person I'm going to go for. I love it how he does that with with Saul. He picks the least likely guy to knock off your horse. You know, sometimes it's easier to knock off the horse those that were already considering Christianity or those that kind of at least weren't anti uh, anti Christianity. God, I love God's just so tenacious. He's like, no, you know, I'm going to pick the least likely one. I'm going to knock him off his horse and I'm going to do into his life. Can we see someone in our life like that? Otherwise, we would be like Ananias. I love it when the Lord speaks. It. So Saul's been knocked off his horse. The Bible says that he's then blind. And the Bible says that God talks to Ananias. And God says to Ananias, Ananias, I want you to go and I want you to lay hands on Saul. He, he's blind and I want you to heal him because he's my chosen vessel. And I love Ananias because he doesn't question the power to be able to heal. See, when we're here in church, oh, yeah, we believe all that stuff, hallelujah. And we, you know, oh, it's all so good. But if God said, right now, this afternoon, I want you to ring the least likely person and I want you to talk to them about Jesus, we would be like Ananias. When God says this to him, Ananias is like, Lord, I've heard many things about this man and how much harm he's done. And it doesn't say, and God said, oh, wow, okay, I didn't know about that. <laughs> That's what we think God's going to say. When God says to you, you know, I want you, you know, your, your daughter's going to get saved. No, you don't know the way she's living now. You don't know the way he's living now. You don't know what he's doing now. And God doesn't go, oh, okay, sorry, I just wasn't up to date on Facebook. I didn't really know where that. God goes, no. He says to him, he is my chosen vessel. Just say, the only thing he says to Ananias is go. Go. Church, we need to go. We need to go to these people and we need to keep believing for them. Why would God choose him? I don't know. Why would God choose you? Why did God choose me? I don't know. Like sometimes I, I think the same. Like why would he do that? He just does it. He likes to do those things. But the, the scripture tells us this in Ephesians 3.19 that we need to know the love of Christ. It passes your knowledge. 
See, there's something in us where we decide who should be loved, who should be reached. But he says this, the love of God goes beyond what we already know. We often sing again, he paid it all. He paid it all. He paid it all for who? Oh, he paid it all for me. Thank you, Jesus. He paid it all for me. I want you to think about that person that you're going to see this week. I want you to think about those ones that you see on the street corners these days. There's so many of them now asking for for money. He paid it all for them. He paid it all for every person. And the reason we know this is just reading through the scriptures. Look at John 4. John 4 talks about the woman at the well. Again, Jesus had the opportunity to talk to so many people. And when left to his own devices, his disciples have gone away. The Bible says he just finds this woman at the well. You know, he didn't have to go and talk to her, but he's going to talk to her. And, he, and, and when we talk about that, when we think about the woman at the well, we remember things like she's had five husbands. That's pretty big. Five husbands. And Jesus says to her, and the husband that you have now is not actually your husband anyway, so that makes six. And so when we think about what do we see? When you're trying to talk, about, oh, well, they won't. I mean, gosh, they, God can't help. They've been married six times. You know, actually, they've been married five times, Pastor, because at the moment they're shacked up. They're not even living. They're living with that person. They're not even married. So, like, let's just choose the nice, clean ones. Let's already choose the filleted fish. What do we see? See, I love the way Jesus sees it. What Jesus sees is a woman that's been rejected five times. Six times, really, in the sense that the guy she's now with doesn't even want to marry her. So you've got to go back in those times. It wasn't really the woman's decision, which means she's been rejected five times. And now she's even decided, I'm going to stay with this guy even though he won't even marry me, even though he won't make me have a reputation. So that means I'm going to have to go out at this time of the day and hide from everybody. Can you see that in people? Can you see their rejection by the decisions that they're making in their wrongful choices? That they really don't know what it is to have the love of Christ? You know, maybe they've been rejected by their father or their mother or someone else. And when you come across them, have you already decided all about them? Well, they just decided to be this way and, you know, this is against... I know those things are true, but Jesus reaches down and he offers to be the seventh, seventh speaking of perfection and purity and completeness and wholeness. Jesus, now he's still told her, you've got to go sin no more. Then Jesus doesn't forget those things, but he wasn't looking for an argument. Jesus isn't always there looking for an argument. He's not wanting us to debate things. Jesus is just looking at winning a soul. I just want to win a soul. I'm not going to make those sort of decisions. He says to her, you who drink of this water will never thirst again. Do you understand about the living water that you have? Because we come here sitting in our comfortable chairs, thinking how wonderful we are, and knowing that we contain living water that we could give to somebody else. You know, when, I, um, when I'm involved at Pulse and stuff like that, I don't see, you know, oh, gosh, sorry. I don't see cocky kids with the answer to everything, I see a lost generation of kids that really all they're looking for is someone to love them, someone to believe that life is better. Now, yeah, we've got to take them out of the hole. It designs not to us to get in the hole with them and accept all these things, but a love to take them out of that, to know that we can offer them something better. Galatians 6 1 says this, brethren. If a man is overtaken with a trespass, if your friend is overtaken with a trespass, if somebody you know is overtaken with a trespass, you who are spiritual are to restore such a one with gentleness, considering yourself lest you be tempted. Not destroy such a one, restore such a one. Jesus in the book of Hebrews, it says this, for the joy set before him endured the cross. The joy of what? The joy of what? What, what did, was the joy? Um, Where's? can you put that photo up? Go 
Got it, sweet. No hurry. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Oh, not that one, sweet. That's okay. We need a little bit of light humour in there. Thank you. I'll just keep going. He'll bring it up. Why do I know for this? John 3, 16. Again, a scripture we all know. Now I'm going to muddle him, ask him to put a picture and read you a scripture. You should know this scripture anyway. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through the world and through him they might be saved. You know, it's a graphic picture. But the reason I know that he believes people can stand is because he was prepared to let his son go through this. He did this. Not so we could play church and have happy church. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And what he needs us to do now is to love people and see in them Come on, you can stand. You can get through this. In 2 Kings 2, we see the story, 2 Kings 4, we see the story of Elijah when Elijah sees that a child is dead. Maybe leave that up there for a little while. He sees that someone's dead and the Bible says that he, he lays hands on it and he believes that this child can have life come back into it. See, often we're, we're already too busy mourning that they've left and it's not going to change, and things aren't going to get any better. And yet our Jesus is the one who raised Lazarus. He wasn't weeping. In Luke chapter 7, it talks about how there's a woman and she's weeping as her son has died and he's in the coffin and they're following the procession of something that is dead. Her son that she loved is dead. And the Bible says that Jesus comes up and he lays hands on the coffin and the child raises up. But see, if we get caught in our Christian life, we're more, ex- more like put out because we just paid for a funeral and it was a waste of money because now the person's risen up. Oh, well, now if they get saved, that means I'm going to have to drive to Hillary's to pick them up to bring them to church. You know, come on. I've got to go out of my way. For this, for this of what our Jesus did, Jairus' daughter, it says that others came and said she's already dead. The world is talking to us like it's already too dead. They're already too far gone. They're already too far into what they're into. People will tell me all the same like, oh, they would never return. They'll never come back to Christianity. They've decided this. They've gone the way. You know what? Nothing. Otherwise, he wouldn't have done this if he didn't believe that all could come to the knowledge of Christ. That God can turn. If God can turn Saul, I don't think any of you, the person you could think of, could be as hard out as what Saul was. And yet God could bring Saul to his knees. So I know that God can bring anyone to their knees and bring them to that place to come back. So the question for us today is who are we listening to? Are you listening to the people who will tell you, you know, your son is never going to be saved? Your daughter is never going to be saved. They are never going to turn away from those things. Your your workmates, you know, you're always going to be the odd one in there. They're never going to turn back to Christ. They're never going to even listen. You know, they're they're whatever they are. They're they're Muslim. They're this, they're that. They're not going to change religion. I'll tell you what, I'm listening to testimony after testimony where people are coming back to Christ. If we really believe that we have the living water, we don't even need to worry. We just have to believe it. I believe Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31, 16 says this. You parents, you need to listen to this. It says, refrain your voice from weeping and your ears, your eyes from tears for your work shall be rewarded. Your children shall come back from the enemy's camp. They will come back in. We've got to believe it. See, I'm going to believe this, not what I see. I believe that for the last 23 years, for every kid that we've had come through our kids' groups and we've taught them the Word of God, whether it's before the rapture or after the rapture, the fact is the seed is in them. So if it means that we're raptured and then they reach that point that they go, okay, what is this all about? I know that I know they're going to go, hang on. 
Remember we learned that scripture, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 13. Every silly little song we've made up, every Friday night that we give up, is never given up for what we're going to see in the kingdom. We might be there, we'll be there before the rapture and then suddenly you're going to see them coming in and go, you know what, that was so worth it. The money that we sow in to see these kids, to be able to come into a community centre and see lives changed. It's worth it. It's worth it if we believe that they're going to stand. If they're going to stand. Husbands often, and it could be the wife, it works both ways. Oh, I don't think my husband's ever going to get saved. I don't believe my wife's ever going to get saved. That's not what scripture says. Scripture in 1 Peter 3 says that they will be won over by your nagging. No, not nagging. That was the other version. They will be won over by your godly behaviour, by your pure conduct. They'll see the way you behave and they will, not might, they will be won over. No matter what's happening. Maybe you've got a Eutychus. They're the ones that sit at the back of the church and they fall asleep. And you just believe, you know what, I don't think they're ever going to get raised from the dead. You need to read the book of Acts. (laughs) Book of Acts, chapter 20. Paul's there feeling like me. This is a good sermon. And I'm not sure. I think some of them are falling asleep, Lord. Okay, then what's going to happen? They're never going to get, you know, and Paul is preaching up the word of God. And the Bible says there's a young boy there. He's bored out of his brain. I've seen many young people sit here bored out of their brain. And he's sitting there and the Bible says he falls out of the three-story building, lands on the floor dead. And Paul says, okay, don't worry about it. Bible says he goes down, prays for him, comes back up and keeps preaching till early hours of the morning. It says, and then they brought the boy up. Hallelujah, he was alive. Can you believe that today for maybe someone you know that you feel like, I just feel they're just falling asleep. They're just not interested. No, you know what? They can stand. Because right at the beginning, I told you, he can make them stand. And we maybe might take that down for a little while. Uh, Where's that might be a bit distracting. Jesus tells us to love one another, to love one another. You know, on Friday when I was talking to the kids and I was teaching them, we were looking at different things that last forever and chewing gum doesn't and money doesn't and sensey smells don't and, you know, your credit on your phone doesn't and all these different things. And I was telling them that, the, you know, the love of the Father and that our God lasts forever and ever. And I didn't go there because some of them are quite young. But the other thing that never dies is people. People will spend eternity in one place or the other. That car that you just brought, that whatever else you just brought this week, those new shoes, that new dress, those whatever you just bought will not last forever. But maybe the person that you're not spending time with, you forget, they're going to live forever somewhere. Everybody's going to spend eternity somewhere. And so we need to believe that God can make them stand. On a side note, sometimes that's easy to believe for everyone. What about just for yourself? Because sometimes maybe you're sitting here today and you've got struggles and it's hard for you to believe. I just don't think I'm going to get through this. I just don't think. I wish I could stand like everybody else stands, but I, I don't think I can. Philippians 1.6 says this. Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. He, you know, when, when Jesus decided to lay down his life, for you, he already knew what it was going to take. There's not one thing you're doing right now that Jesus says, oh, well, I didn't realise it was going to be that hard. I'm giving up on it. I mean, Joey Norris, come on. I thought it was going to be easy, but it's just too hard. You know, Elba, I just thought, you know, nah, let's, we'll just give away Elba. Let's start. He never did that. He knew. He said, being confident that he's already paid the price and he knows that you're going to be able to stand. He's going to make you stand in the end time. There is going to come a place, no matter how far you're even stretching out your belief system. So God said, that's okay. He's paid it all. He weighed up what it would take. And he paid the full price. 
People don't pay for stuff these days. They don't pay for nothing. Like everyone wants everything for free. People are not paying the debts. It's, it's just crazy across the world. I was talking to someone this week and they were saying, you know, they'd gone to their hairdresser and the hairdresser was saying that, you know, someone wanted their hair done and after they've already started, they're like, oh, I don't have the money. Would it be okay to pay you in two weeks? And... I mean, what are you going to say? Oh, okay, no worries. And she said, and as she went on to do her hair, she's talking about how the different things she's got to go buy and how she wants to buy um, a, a dog. And you know, it would be hard to cut someone's hair like that. <laughs> oh, yeah, I have to cut price haircut. But, you know, I mean, that's what the world's like. I'll pay you tomorrow. Jesus already paid in beforehand. He already paid the price. He's not going to change his mind. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts I have towards you. He's got great thoughts. He's got a future for you. He's got great things installed. And he just needs you to be able to believe, okay, I might, I might not be standing too well, but I'm going to stand. And God is in control right now. I'm going to trust him with all of my heart. I'm not going to lean on my own understanding. I'm going to acknowledge him. And I know that God can make me stand. Because he's paid the price for me. To know that God is going to raise me up in these last days. Sometimes it's easy to get distracted and just, okay, I don't know if I'm going to make it. And I think when we struggle to know where in, we forget to bring someone else. And I want to encourage you, we're going to just take communion right now. If our ushers can come and hand out communion. And maybe Wes, we can put that photo back up. I want you to know that Jesus paid the price for you already. He already paid the price. He said, I want you to be able to go live in heaven. And so if you will confess me as Lord and Saviour of your life, if you will make me your Lord, I will pay the penalty of your sin. He paid the penalty for everybody's sin. But our freedom comes by accepting what he did for us on the cross. He did this for everybody. Not just for some people, not just for the good people, not just for anyone. He paid the price for everybody. And our part is just to accept that. So even this morning as we take the, the communion juice and the bread and we think about what Jesus did, I want you to think about how he did that for you. The blood he shed was so that you could spend eternity in heaven. The blood that he shed was so that you could walk free in freedom and in healing and in so many blessings. But also, as you receive that cup, I want you just to think about who it might be. You know, when Jesus first took communion, he still had Judas there. At any point, Judas could have turned and decided to acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Saviour. I want you to think about that person that you've given up on or that person that you haven't even decided to try and ask, that workmate, that person that you just don't really want to say anything to in case they make fun of you. We already heard what real persecution is about in our missions areas. I want you to think about that person and understand that it's not about what you do or what you say, but about what Jesus already did for them. And I want you to get a tenacity deep down in your spirit as you take this communion juice in a minute and it will go right down into your inner self. I want you to think about those people that are around your life that you could offer living water. As we take this, And we think about the living water that Jesus has given us, the life, the freedom that he set us free. Then also think about those people. Think about those people. Father, right now as we think about what you did on the cross, Father God, as we take this blood, as we look at Father God, as we take this bread, sorry, and we look at that picture that's quite graphic, Father, on what you did on the cross. You were whipped and beaten and marred that it says your body was not even recognisable because you loved us, because you knew the price of the sin that had to be paid so that you would set us all free. 
Father God, so we just take this bread right now and we think about, Father God, what you have done. And Father, we take this blood, we take this drink, as we think about what you did on the cross, Father God, and we ask you to forgive us, Father, for those that we've stopped praying for. Father, those that we've stopped interceding for. Father, those that we've banished from our thoughts, from our lives, Father God. And, and in some of that, that's wisdom, Father God. But Lord, not in our prayers, ever. Ever in our prayers to give up praying for them. Father, this week we make a choice to believe that they can stand. Father, to believe, Father God, that that is your desire for them to stand. And Father, like we saw in that video, we would be encouraging them. We would be declaring your truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you, Lord, that through you we are able to stand. Father God, through adversity, through affliction through our own silly mistakes, through our own bad choices, Father, whatever it might be. Father God, we are able to stand. And Father, your desire is, Lord, the same as the woman at the well and the same as the woman in adultery and, Father, so many others, Lord, that we would repent, Father, and we would turn back to you. Father God, we would, Father, move away from the things that displease you. Father God, we would remember that we are a holy people separated unto you. And Father, through our separated lives, others would be drawn. But Father, also that we would believe, Father God, that repentance is open to everybody. The call goes out to everybody, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Father God, we just lift up, Father, those people around us. Father, those people in our community, those people at our playgroups and kids clubs and Surge and Pulse, Father God, and Lord, our connect group, anywhere. And we believe, Father God, that thousands this day will have an opportunity to take, make Jesus Christ their Lord. That they will come out of the snares of the enemy who've held them in captivity. They shall open their eyes from darkness to light. They shall come out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And Father, we rejoice. Father, we speak to those dry bones and we command them to live, says the Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.